Hola amigos, welcome to Latina Living History. I'm Katie and today we're going to talk more about the Latina part of Latina Living History. I've said before that I am Latina, but it hasn't been until the last few years that I've really sort of embraced that moniker for myself. Uh, my dad is Mexican, but he was adopted by an American family and his birth records are no longer accessible to us. So I don't have a lot of information about that biological side of my family, but I figured we have so many resources available now. I can look into what being Latina or Latino, Latinx, means to different people and myself. And one of the ways that I decided I wanted to do that was through the project that I'm calling La Vida Josefina. I started it on Instagram and I was inspired by Heather who is making another American Girl wardrobe for their doll Felicity for herself and Jessica who is making Kirsten's wardrobe. Now, if you haven't heard of American Girls, obviously they're not a worldwide phenomenon, but they were a group of 18-inch dolls that came out in the 80s about historical girls. They were 8 to 12 years old, I believe, and each doll represented a different time period. And in 1997, the company released Josefina. And I remember I was 11 that year, and my sister and I hadn't really had a lot of access to Mexican stuff. It's not like we had the internet. It was 1997. And so all we knew was what our parents told us. And there just weren't that many resources. So to have this doll come out and she looked like us and she was Mexican and she had these fabulous clothes and stories and just this incredible world of knowledge and access that we hadn't had before really opened up for us. And my mom was great. We, Holly and I each already had an American Girl doll that we had saved up for ourselves and we weren't rolling in it, so to speak, but my mom set aside money and bought the family a Josefina doll because it meant so much to us to have that representation. So thumbs up to mom, really, really facilitating this historical thing and the Latina thing from a very young age. She did the best she could with the resources we had, which was not a lot pre-internet. So. Earlier this year, or late last year, I decided I want to recreate Josefina's wardrobe. I'm really interested in the history of where my family comes from, and while we don't have connection too strongly to any living family members or anything like that, I can look into that history. I have the world at my fingertips through the World Wide Web, so why not start looking? So in typical over-enthusiastic fashion, I started diving into the clothes, because that's how I got into living history. I really went through making and researching and wearing the clothing and then got more interested in the actual history of different areas and different peoples. And Regency, which is the early 19th century, and Josefina here represents the year 1824, so kind of right at the end of that period, but that's one of my favorite time periods to make and wear the clothes from. So I was really excited because it's like a double bonus. It's Regency stuff. It's Mexican stuff right up my alley. But if you know anything about fashion history, you can take a look at this cute little girl and see she's not wearing a Regency dress. This is a very distinctive outfit that a lot of characters in her books, because each doll comes with a series of books to tell her story, they're all wearing this, all the women. And there are some more European influenced fashions that appear in the illustrations. But by and large, the women in her family are wearing this outfit. And it's not like anything that I had seen in my research into European fashion from that time period. So I was intrigued. And this is where I fell down a pretty big research rabbit hole. And if the last few months of human history have taught me anything, it's that human history is uncomfortable, right? I mean, we've all got this idea of what our past looked like. And I don't know about you, but the last few months have really sort of started to peel back the layers and show me that what I thought history looked like wasn't the whole story. There have been black, indigenous, and people of color throughout history that have not lived the life that I was told most people lived. And I don't know how many of them there were, but there were a lot. And in order to really do a deep dive on where we came from, I think we all need to learn to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's where I found myself with this story. Uh, so 
I'm not going to get graphic, but the story deserves to be told. And it starts out in the 17th century, the early 1600s, with the legend of La China Poblana, which is the name of this style, as well as of a person. We're going to call her Mira because some of the stories that go into this iconic legend named her that. They also called her Catarina de San Juan, but that was not her given name. So I'm going to call her Mira because as far as I know, that was the name of her birth. And so in the early 1600s, the legend goes a princess from India or a noble's daughter from India or maybe the Philippines, not quite clear on that, was kidnapped and was the victim of human trafficking. She came to Mexico by way of pirates or slave traders, depending on which version you're listening to, and was sold to a man in Puebla. Uh, so basically you've got a young girl who came to Mexico under duress. And the story goes that her owner, which you can't own people, but that was a thing, throughout most of human history, uh, they were, that he and his wife were childless and treated Mira like a daughter. I'm not sure what that means, but that's what the legend says. Now, when he and his wife died, they apparently wrote it into their will or something that Mira was to be a free woman. So to me, that means that they probably had the right and the wherewithal to free her at any time and didn't, which again, we need to learn to be uncomfortable. I'm not really cool with that, but that's how the story goes. Uh, at some point, Mira, she converted to Catholicism, and after she became a free woman, she either married or joined a Jesuit church or both. Nobody's really clear on what order those things happened in or if they both happened or what went on there, but we do know that she was highly regarded in the religious community as Caterina de San Juan. Uh, she had lots of followers. She was said to have had visions and have talked to Jesus and things like that, which in that time and place in the Catholic faith was a big deal. She did not become a nun, and she was not canonized as a saint because the European Catholic Church didn't like that. But she was very highly regarded and was buried in the sacristy of the Jesuit church in Puebla. So that means she was pretty important. People who mattered got buried in churches, historically speaking. So that was pretty cool. And now that's actually called La Tumba de la China Poblana. So it's still known as the Tomb of La China, which I should say, in that time and place, China just meant Asian woman. So it's not a woman from China. It's the Asian woman, and Poblana means from Puebla, which is the community where she lives. So La China Poblana is the Asian woman from Puebla. Now, how did one woman become such an icon, which eventually turned into an entire archetype of what it meant to be Mexican? Well, obviously, that story is a little unlikely. I mean, wouldn't you if you were writing the story, want to be a princess that came over and became a saint. I mean, it's probably the, the biggest and best version of what could have possibly happened, which history is written that way. So take everything with a grain of salt. But it's likely to me that Mira was not the only Asian person to come over to Mexico either on their own or against their will. So it seems likely to me that there was a broader influence of Asian people and culture and fashion coming into Mexico in the colonial era that then sort of influenced where fashion went after that. And in the 19th century, which is when you really start to see La China Poblana as an icon and an idea and a defining character in what it meant to be Mexican, the 19th century was a huge time of change for Mexico. They were striving to become independent from Spain and they wanted to be Mexico, not Nueva España. And so these specific archetypes arose and you had El Charro, which was like the cowboy in the heavily decorated wool outfit with braiding and the big sombrero that's all fancy. And you had La China. 
And so that is what Little Miss Josefina here is wearing. She is wearing a very common traditional costume that came out of this legend, but I think probably more likely it came out of a broader base of fashion influence. And if you go further back into the 18th century, there were these things called Costa paintings, which showed the various castes in New Mexico and how various social groups and racial groups intermarrying created new groups. And you can see outfits similar to this in some of the Mestiza fashion in those paintings. So it wasn't just Catarina de San Juan or Mira wore this outfit and now everyone does. There was a gradual evolution and now we have this quite charming sort of outfit that really came to embody what a Mexican woman of a certain class level was. One of the things that I find really interesting about this China Poblana fashion is that it survived for decades in the 19th and early 20th century. And actually, it's still a thing. If you look at um, Baile Folklorico, uh, folk dance, you still see that influence in the outfits today. And to me, that's really cool because European fashion has these very specific fashion benchmarks that it sort of went through in the 19th century and 20th century. And you can, you know, narrow things down almost to the year by what people are wearing sometimes in fashion plates, portraiture, paintings, and later on in fo photos. But this look, this China Poblana look, went throughout the 19th century into the 20th century, and people are still using it as folk costume. And it's not, it's not subject to change the way that European fashion has been. And that's somewhat the case for folk costume throughout the world, but for me, this one is is extra special. So I don't know exactly who Mira was, but I know she existed. There's records of her existence and death and of how people respected her in Puebla. And I hope that you can find a moment of connection through hearing her story. And I plan to find my moment of connection by digging deeper and exploring what it feels like to wear this outfit and the other outfits that are influenced by La China Poblana and the idea of who she was and what that icon became in Mexican history. So now that we've learned to be uncomfortable with learning history, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the various parts of the outfit that I'm going to be making. So having this doll to represent a little Mexican girl at the time when I was also a little Mexican girl was really special to me. And I'm really excited to have one of these outfits and put it on and feel like what it would have felt like. So the first part in recreating Josefina's outfit was to break it down into its individual parts. And I'm gonna walk you through them pretty quickly, but I've already started working on some of them. So hopefully I should have progress to show you soon. You can follow that on my Instagram account for this project. It's at La Vida Josefina on Instagram, and there will be a link at the end of the video. The first piece is her cute little camisa. Camisa just means shirt. This is very common in any of the China Poblana illustrations that you'll see. Uh, Rich is gonna put up a montage, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Construction-wise, I'm approaching this like a shift or a chemise from the 19th century. I don't have any particular documentation for that, but I can also use it for other time periods if I do that. And I already have a nice linen that I've washed and ironed and then washed again when a cat peed on it because that's my life. I'm a little nervous because I've been doing living history for 16, 14 years now, and I've never made a shift that fits me. They're all like circus tents. So I'm gonna make a mock-up. There's probably gonna be cursing but eventually I will hopefully have a cute little camisa like this one with cute little lace along the neckline and along the sleeves and it'll be nice and cool and comfy. I've actually already started working on the skirt. I was super happy to find a red fabric with a really cute floral wreath print and I posted pictures of that and a little more information on my blog which is blog.katielovely.com and I'll link it below and that's actually almost ready to, to be done. I need to hem it because I've also made a petticoat to go under it. One of the defining features of the China Poblana fashion is that 
there's always some sort of a fancy petticoat hanging out from underneath that's a definitely part of the outfit that's meant to be seen. So I made a separate petticoat, even though Josefina here only has a faux petticoat underneath her skirt. And I'm hoping to be able to use that for other time periods as well. But that's done and ready to go. Now I just need to put the skirt on over the petticoat and make sure that it's hemmed at the right length so that you can see the pretty lace on the bottom. There's also a woven belt and weaving is a huge part of Mexican culture, indigenous culture to be specific. Um, I remember going to Mexico a couple of times to visit my dad's hometown and the Mayan population in the area uh, weaves beautiful, amazing fabrics. Um, and so we've got you know, photos and I've got these really distinct memories of these Chamula women with backstrap looms and some of them were big. Like it's, it's just a apparatus with the warp and it's stretched between the weaver and like a tree stump. And it's this incredible art. And, um, normally if I want something woven, I ask my mom because she's also a weaver. She's not the Mexican half of my family, but she's very into textile arts and weaving. But this belt, this belt right here on the doll is cotton, but it's likely that an actual belt of this type would be wool. And my mother is hideously allergic to wool. So if I want an accurate belt, I'm probably going to have to learn to do it myself. Now, fortunately, my friend Kristen just told me that my friend Annalise, who is also an accomplished weaver, mentioned that she could tell us about backstrap weaving. So that may be part of my future is to say, help me, Annalise, and have her teach me her ways. And I really would be honored to learn this awesome, like this, this art that is so much a part of the culture and the land and all of that. But I also have like 10 thumbs. So we will see. I, I am open to the idea of finding an ethical source for something like this as well. Um, the last part of the outfit is a cotton reboso, and the reboso is a very, very common garment in Mexico. It's used for um, protecting yourself from the sun, protecting yourself from the weather, for carrying children, for carrying objects. It's just this ubiquitous thing that women have. And so I actually have seen mentions of in particular, cotton rebosos in, uh, I think a source from 1826 was the most notable one that I found. Um, and so I'm really excited. I have actually several rebosos from Mexico, contemporary ones, um, that people have gifted me or that came from the trips that we took as children to visit my dad's hometown. But this one is going to be cotton, and I'm hoping to find something with a really cool woven pattern that sort of pays homage to this but is more along the lines of a traditional pattern. This is just kind of a random random ecot woven pattern but there are incredible textiles that came out of Mexico and I'm hoping to find something that can really honor that. All right guys that was pretty heavy for a while there but I hope I hope that you made it through it and that you were able to kind of find a deeper understanding of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and what it means to me because I was surprised at how deeply it affected me learning about all of this and I hope that you can gain some of that understanding as well. Thank you so much for watching. I'll put some links in the description to selected sources that I use when researching Latina Poblana. As always, you can find me on Facebook at Latina Living History, Instagram at La Vida Josefina, and my blog at blog.katielovely.com. Thanks again. Adios.